speaker is Donna, Donny Procoso. Donny has lots of identity. He's a software engineer. He is a self-proclaimed barista, cafe racer enthusiast, and senior developer advocate. Hi, Donny. He focuses on helping developers understand varieties of technologies to transform ideas into execution. He loves coffee and discussing topics from microservices to AI and machine learning. Uh, today's topic is called orchestrating work flow for microservices integration. Donnie will talk about AWS Stack Functions, which lets you coordinate multiple AWS services into serverless workflow so that you can build your and update apps quickly. As developer, you understand how to get started with AWS Stack Functions and how to integrate with microservices. So now we have Donnie here, and yep. we can see the screen. And uh, I will hand over time to Donnie. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, just want a quick check. Can you hear my voice? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Awesome. OK. Um, OK, so hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well and safe. And thank you for joining us in this session. And thanks to API Days for this wonderful opportunity. So today, we're going to talk about three things. Um, there are microservices, asynchronous communication, and lastly, orchestration. And most of the content in this session is based on my own experience building distributed system. And this session is actually tailored for intermediate developers. And I might skip one or few basic things, uh, but don't worry if you have any questions, which is out of the scope of this session, let's take it offline and ping me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I'd love to jump into the discussion with you. So uh, the thing about microservices is it's challenging. It's challenging because it's distributed. And when it comes to distributed system, the thing that we need to understand properly is how we design the services to interact or communicate with each other, right? And of course, there are quite a number of options when it comes to integration patterns. So yeah, so let's jump in. So I'll be your host for today. Let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Donny Prakoso. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS. And just like you, I'm a developer as well. I started my professional experience as a software engineer, R&D manager, and CTO for several startups. I'm so grateful that companies that I've worked with in the past were a strong advocate of modern technology in various verticals, from banking industry, telco, to startups. I'm specialized in microservices as I had my first encounter to distributed system around 12 years ago when I was working in telco industry. So if you have any questions to microservices or even machine learning, feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn and Twitter. So uh, as I've mentioned, we're going to cover three things in this session. There are microservices, asynchronous communication, and also workflow orchestration. And for some of you, it might sound a lot. And to ease your understanding, here's the structure of this session. So first, we're going to quickly cover on technical aspects on why developers are moving to microservices, just to give a bit context on why we are here. I will elaborate how microservices could help us to deliver a scalable and reliable system and minimizing a potential risk such as a single point of failure like what we have in monolith architecture. But as like other architectures, microservices also has uh, some set of challenges. So it's not enough only to know how to build APIs. We also need to understand on how they communicate either synchronous or using asynchronous communication. So in this section, I'll quickly cover why it's not a good idea to build the entire microservices with synchronous REST API, as it will quickly become a problem when we try to scale our system by adding more services. And that's a good segue on how we could utilize asynchronous communication to tackle this challenge. Then when it comes to asynchronous communication, we are facing a different services and we need to manage um, the flow of the entire system. So there are two things that we usually do, orchestration and choreography. With choreography, you usually use a message broker and orchestration, you use a centralized application to manage the flow of the request. And I'd like to introduce you to AWS Step Functions and how we could have more clean, robust, reusable, but yet still independent, isolated and scalable services. So there's a lot of things that we need to unpack. I'll try to finish it in 15 to 20 minutes before we jump into the demo. And also, um, to ease your journey into the cloud, I'm happy to inform that I've launched a learning platform, SlideScript. SlideScript is a short, concise, and developer-focused courses, and all the content are crafted for you to get started with the practical implementation of cloud technologies. So if you want to learn something new, head over to slidescript.dev. There are a few additional courses coming its way. So this session is highly influenced by Werner Vogels, CTO of Amazon. In one of his articles, he mentioned that failures are a given and everything will eventually fail over time. Now, 
the question is, if this statement is true, then how we could make our system reliable? And to think about this, the best answer I could have is probably on how we could minimize the probability of failures while still ensuring our system to maximize the odds serving the request. And most of the problem when it comes to microservices, it lies on how services could communicate, either it's an um, internal request or external request. So with this kind of perspective, it allows us to reevaluate on how we structure and design our system. Another example that is yet relevant to the previous code is more businesses are moving to microservices to improve the development velocity and improve the uptime of their system. So let's do a quick overview on the difference between monolithic and also microservices to understand uh, more before we begin our journey to asynchronous communication. So monoliths, they are easy to build and uh, fairly easy to reason about. It's way simpler to understand how the system is going to work when all your data is one asset compliant database and all of the calls you're making are operating against the same environment. So uh, in Monolith, it's also easier in terms of development as all of the team members are contributing in a single code base. But since we only have a single code base, the problem that usually rising is if we have multiple teams, is we're going to have a bottleneck on release pipeline. Now, the reason is because having one large code base, it makes a tight coupling where everyone are working on have a high probability that it might affect them. So among all the technical and managerial reasons, the main problem is monoliths don't scale. And we need an application that actually scale. So monolith application is a great way to start with, but over time, we'll eventually need to move to distributed system. And in the other hand, distributed systems such as microservices are way more complex. Uh, here are a few tenets on microservices. Um, they are polyglot, which means you can use different programming language, uh, use different frameworks to build your services. Its black box means that it abstracts away the complexities of each service. Uh, they are independent, so you can have multiple teams building different services. They are decentralized, and this gives you an advantage as to improve your performance velocity without having to have a tight coupling or dependencies with another teams. And each of these services only does one thing well and no overlapping. And as there are independent services, uh, a problem in one service will have less blast radius compared to monolithic application. And being decentralized and independent are two aspects that becomes the foundation of this session. And by having the flexibility to build services, now what we need to do is how the services could interact one to another, right? And then, and when it comes to communication, we'll naturally think about APIs, right? And yes, APIs are the front door of microservices. They become the interface to interact with services which holds business logic of specific domains. And when it comes to APIs, we will naturally think to build REST APIs um, or any kind of form of synchronous communication. So uh, let's imagine that we are building an e-commerce application. So here we have two services. We have order service and also we have invoice service. Order service will take care of everything that our customer checked out. And invoice service will notify the accounting, uh, finance department, and the customers as well. Right? Uh, and then in this context, uh, the system were built using REST APIs. So when we send a POST request to order service, uh, which order service needs to make a downstream call to invoice service, then it will be processed by invoice service before it returns status OK to order service. And finally, the order service send it back to the client. Right? In ideal case, everything works well, right? And but what happened if one of the service has some kind of issue? So uh, in this case, invoice order, um, sorry, the invoice service needs to perform the request, and it took longer than expected. And at the end, it will return gateway timeout, and the order service will have a problem as well because it didn't get the proper return from invoice service, then you might think that, oh, yeah, I think this is the time that we need to build some kind of retry mechanism and circuit breaker, right? And those two, they are useful patterns. But in this case, the underlying problem isn't how you handle the error, but how to minimize the error on surface communication. And as a solution, we could implement asynchronous communication by leveraging message or even bus to choreograph the communication uh, between services. And um, this is one example of request reply pattern. 
uh, where clients send a request to all the surface and all the surface will immediately return respond back to the client that the request is created and return some kind of ID and the URL for the client to retrieve the result. And um, in the background, since the request might take longer time to finish, the order service not directly call the invoice service, but instead it's going to send a message to even bus. So even or messaging bus will then receive and route the matching patterns of message to specific target. And in this case is invoice service. Now invoice service now has the request, right? And meanwhile, the client will try to do polling requests to the invoice service. And once the invoice service is done processing, it will provide the results back to the client. Yeah, so, and yes, building APIs is really important, but we also need to think how services uh, communicate effectively. And uh, at this, and this is only one example to illustrate that we can utilize asynchronous communication. At this point, you might think, uh, well, asynchronous communication seems so cool, uh, but do I need to replace all of my synchronous APIs with asynchronous communication? And that depends. More than often, I see that a lot of developers uh, in different verticals successfully integrate these two forms of communication into their system um, and still relate to the black box concept uh, when we make an API call, uh, all we see is one endpoint URL and we're connecting through REST API. But in the background, all of the relevant system that process the request interacts with asynchronous communication. And this is one example to abstract away the complexities of the system by using REST API for public API and asynchronous communication for internal services. And this table quickly describes a few important things to differentiate how we use API and asynchronous communication. So when we build the API, we need a central point to manage all incoming requests and also to delegate to which request or path these requests need to be forwarded. And not only that, we also need a safe medium because it is the meeting point between the client and the backend, which is generally exposed to the public. And to prevent this, API Gateway is usually used. On the other hand, before asynchronous communication reacts in a new event happening in the system or using a central service to coordinate all of services. So there are two ways on how you can do this. The first one is using choreo uh, choreography pattern. And the second one is using the orchestration pattern. In choreography, each service can execute independently in response to a particular event. So other services can retrieve the message asynchronously and complete their respective tasks. Now with this architecture, services are loosely coupled and do not have a direct impact on each other. And uh, in orchestration pattern, we use a central service to connect all of services until the entire process is completed. And this distributed character of microservices makes it challenging to orchestrate workflows when multiple microservices are involved. Um, and developers might be tempted to add orchestration directly into the application. Orchestration patterns introduce a concept of delegating the instruction in order to reduce the tight coupling and makes it easier to replace individual service. In following section, we're going to dive deeper into orchestration pattern and I'm inviting you to imagine that you're handling a banking system in which you need to implement an onboarding flow for creating a new account. In this simplified banking system, we have four services in four domains. A con application service has a responsibility to accept applications for people who want to open a bank account and is responsible for returning an approve or reject decision. A data checking service is responsible for performing various validation of data, such as uh, checking the identity documentation or verifying that a home address appears to be valid. And human review service, which tracks application that needs um, a review and allows a human to make decision about flag applications. And finally, we have the account service, uh, which is responsible for creating and managing a bank account after the new account application has been approved. And here's how these services work in concert with one another. Right? The account application service takes in a new application, and then it performs the data checks, uh, flex an application for review by a human if required, and finally passes approved decisions to the account service. And if you look at this particular use case, it seems that the account applications on the right holds a vital role on managing the workflow of account creation. And this is a good case for orchestration. 
So from the point of view of the account application service, it needs to make a downstream calls to several other services and reacting to their responses. So let's quickly go through the step. So when a new account application is received, it calls data checking service to check the identity information provided in the application. It also verifies the address of the applicant. Then if any of those checks come back with a flag, a human reviewer will get involved to make a decision. Finally, if an approval decision was made, it calls out to the account service to open a new account. So at this point, we understand how the workflow of this account creation process. But the next question is how to translate this workflow into technical implementation for our microservices. And to be able to implement this workflow, let's step back a bit and quickly review state machine. So a state machine simply describes a collection of computational steps that we want to split into discrete states. There's always only one starting state and only one state is active at a time. The basic building blocks of a state machine are states and transitions. And state is the situation based on the previous inputs and cause a reaction on following inputs. And the transition defines for which input the state is changed from one to another state. And simply put, you can think of this like a workflow or an executable uh, flowchart. As the steps of the state machine activate, the active state is going to get some input, do something with that input, generate some output, and indicate the next state to the transition to. Now, because the nature of state machine is abstract, it's such a powerful way to coordinate workflow. And to implement a state machine with AWS, you can use a service called AWS Step Functions. AWS Step Functions lets you coordinate multiple AWS services into serverless workflows so you can build and update application quickly. Using AWS Step Functions, you can design and run workflows that stitch together services such as AWS Lambda, AWS Fargate, Amazon SageMaker, and other services into feature-rich application. And you can write resilient workflows with built-in error handling and retry mechanism. And you can also audit the execution history with visual monitoring for your state machine executions, letting you visually trace and debug when needed. So let's try uh, to coordinate the banking system workflow that we discussed earlier into the state machine. So first, we'll verify the identity documents provided by the applicant. Then we'll check to make sure their home address appears to be valid. And then we might need to involve a human review uh, the data in the application. Then we'll wait for the review to happen. And finally, we can approve the application. So at first glance, this is complete, but let's try to improve this workflow. First, we don't need to be doing the identity check and the address check in a serial fashion. So the result of one doesn't depend on the output of the other. So instead, we could arrange to have these steps completed in parallel. Yeah, so it looks like this. Uh, next, we can improve the steps that happen after the two checks are performed. And uh, we should explicitly encode a step that a human review is only required if the identity or address checks fail. So it's possible to go straight from the checks to an approved application. And finally, we should have an explicit step showing a rejected application and showing that the human review step can transition to either an approve or a reject decision. And it looks like this, right? And here's the final state machine that we made some improvement. So there are two things that I like to emphasize here. Uh, with state machine and other step functions, it allows us to create a reliable workflow. And what most important is with step function, we could easily adjust the flow, quickly replace and change the flow as needed. And this pretty much sums the reality where workflows often iterate to a new and improved version. So let's jump into the demo where we're going to uh, try to implement this workflow with AWS step functions. So in this demo, we'll do three scenarios. The first scenario will demonstrate if a request satisfies all mandatory requirements and straight to be approved. The second scenario is to use the human check review. It will go to human check review before it's getting approved. And the last scenario is similar to second scenario, which will go through human review, but to have requests rejected eventually. Okay, so what you see on the screen now is my AWS Step Function dashboard. Uh, as you can see that um, I've already go to the, uh, to the 
to this to this definition that I have right now. Okay, so and then if you go to this, uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, and if you're wondering how the definition of state machine could be formed, you can go to this definition. So this definition is really uh, simple. It's actually a JSON written in Amazon state language. As you can see that you can see this is actually a JSON. And at the uh, on the right side, you can see the graph generated by the JSON itself. So it's really convenient to see the official representation of the code that we have. Right. So um, this is the uh, how it looks like. And then uh, this is the same state machine that I use for the slides. And uh, the best thing about this state function is that you can actually start the execution right into the dashboard console. So if I go to the start execution, right? And then I just passed in my um, the first scenario, which is going to be uh, approve everything. Uh, this is a simple JSON that I use. I put a name, I put the document as true, address as true as well, and amount is 1,000. And if I click on the start execution, uh, the flow will be directly uh, go to the approved application, as you can see now. Hey, right. So I think everything's worked well for the first scenario. And then for the second scenario, we're going to go to the human review, but still approve the request. So let's start the new execution. Oopsie, there you go. So I, as you can see that I put the document as false. So it means that you need to get the human review check. And if I start the execution, and then if I go to scroll here, you can see that it's pretty fast. So you can, um, so the uh, request go to the human required, uh, review required, uh, wait for review, uh, review approve, and then approve the applications. And for the last scenario, we're going to make the, um, this, uh, this the request rejected. So I'll put the document and also the address to be false, which means that will go through the human review. And because the amount is quite big, which is uh, 10,000, it will going auto to automatically rejected. So if we start the execution, and then you can see that it's now on reject application. See, um, and one thing that I want to note here is that wait for review, this is actually calling an external microservice, uh, and then it's going to be performed in asynchronous fashion, and it's going to return the, and it's going to pause the workflow, the state machine workflow, and then once it gets to respond back to the, from the microservice, it's going to resume back the operation. So uh, in this case, the AWS function is really versatile tools. Uh, for those requests who needs to have an end-to-end -end workflow, and then you need to have a full control of the uh, of the application, right? And you might think about, hey, how about the input and output? It's it's fairly simple. If you see it here, the step input is in JSON, and if you go to the uh, if you go to the step output, you can see that it's in JSON as well, right? So that's a quick uh, introduction of uh, AWS Step Functions. Okay, so. Um, so at this point, we understand how, what a step, step function is and how versatile it is as a tool to integrate our microservices. So let's take a look into some examples uh, on how we could use AWS Step Function. So here's one example on how we could utilize Step Functions to implement Saga pattern. So imagine that you have an e-commerce website, and once that you your customers check out their cart, we need to process the order. We start by checking the stock. If we have the stock for all items, then we can continue to process the payment. If the payments are okay, then the flow goes to the logistic service to ship the order to our customers. And once it's done, we mark the transaction as a success and send a success notification to customers. So everything's working well there. Uh, however, there's a chance that there will be some issues on stock checking, payment processing, or coordinating with logistic service. So in case of a problem on logistic service, then we need to roll back the transaction and cancel the logistic service and cancel payment. In case if there's an issue on payment processing, then we need to cancel the payment, but not necessarily cancel the logistic service because it's not created yet. In, in if there's no stock left for the items ordered, we can mark the transaction as failed and alert customer service. So for every failed transaction, it will go to alert customer service and mark it as failed. Otherwise, we will send a success notification to the customers. Hi, Tony. Sorry. So, I thank you for joining <laughs> the session. I hope this session, and along with the demo, give you an insight on how you could orchestrate your workflow and fit into your microservices. You can also get this deck by going to this URL and join my newsletter to get future updates. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to reach out to me at Twitter and LinkedIn. 
thanks again, everyone. Thank you again, API Days, and see you next time. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, thank you, Tony, for today's first ball walkthrough. Uh, since time is running short, we cannot yeah. go through Q&A section, but sure. I think you can pass your question to Tony directly. And thanks again for all of your participation. And right now, we 